Well, they gave me this title. Uh, it says uh, the Legerfo Coda. And uh, I figure that means I can say whatever I want here. Uh, so it's maybe a little bit different. Uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, key issues I'm going to address from my perspective uh, then is uh, when to operate and what to measure in these feet. I have no disclosures. <clears throat> I have three goals to explain why preoperative testing is seldom of value and can be harmful in the care of diabetic foot ulcers. I want to summarize the indications for arterial reconstruction and uh, explain how the limited life expectancy affects clinical decisions. Now, I consider an understanding of the pathophysiology of diabetic foot ulceration is absolutely essential to optimizing your ability to care for these patients. And furthermore, I think most of this can be explained to patients, and that really empowers them to understand what is going on and to take better care of themselves. The <clears throat> Going back a few years, and George was kind enough to uh, refer to this paper I wrote with uh, my fabulous colleague, uh, Jay Kaufman, 1984. But back then, we were perplexed by these foot ulcers, and there was this idea there was this strange microvascular occlusion that was responsible for them, and you couldn't do anything about it. So it was very depressing. So we got rid of that, but how do we replace it? I can give you some of the components, but I can't answer all of them. And just to go through things in general, there is, of course, the motor neuropathy that affects the intrinsic muscles of the foot, the shape of the foot, creates pressure points uh, subject to ulceration. There's a sensory neuropathy that affects the pain and temperature fibers, the longest, finest fibers the most, and less so on touch and proprioception. So this is deceptive for patients. They think they can feel with their foot because when they touch it, they can feel, but you have to explain to them. They could step on a needle or, as was shown yesterday, a bottle cap and not know it. The autonomic neuropathy uh, affects the circulation with AV shunning that makes it the, the existing circulation inefficient. It's deceptive because the foot appears pink unless you elevate it. There's no sweat or oil gland function. And uh, so you get this dry skin, cracked skin, calluses, they're like stones the patient is walking on, and this creates portals of entry for infection. What I really want to emphasize is this other aspect of the sensory neuropathy, and that is how it affects the neuroinflammatory response in the diabetic foot. Now, it works like this. <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, axon reflex, and let me see if I can, uh, involves uh, an injury to these very fine sensory nerves. They're all over the place. There's probably not two millimeters of your skin that doesn't have one of these ultra-fine fibers associated with it. The uh, action potential uh, that's created with an injury to that uh, nerve ending travels centrally to the spinal cord, but it also travels peripherally along the adjacent branches of the axon. So the sensory nerve then becomes a transmitter nerve. Uh, those sensory nerves contain packets of neuropeptides. They're formed in the cell body near the spinal cord, and they travel down the uh, nerve like a little varix. And uh, they contain several neuropeptides, the most famous of which is substance P. Substance P, as you probably know, uh, it makes the mast cells uh, degranulate, release histamine, cause the wheel and flare reaction uh, following a skin injury. Uh, neuropeptide Y, uh, we're very interested in. This uh, uh, neuropeptide is essential in wound healing. Uh, uh, it uh, guides uh, angiogenesis in the healing wound. It's complex, has a lot of functions, has five receptors. Uh, calcitonin gene-related peptide uh, causes vasodilatation, uh, transudation of fluid. And there's six or seven other neuropeptides that really haven't been studied much at all. So this is a complex system that engages the white cells and the dendritic cells 
uh, in the skin to participate in the initial response to any skin injury. This is why if you scratch your skin, within a few seconds you develop a little bit of erythema. It's fantastic. That's the immediate defense of the skin against any injury. This uh, loss of the neuroinflammatory response precedes any detectable evidence of somatic neuropathy. So this occurs very early in the course of uh, diabetes. Uh, Lena Prethan uh, is my colleague, uh, has uh, developed this nice uh, model on the rabbit ear where we can make, can make the rabbits have diabetes. Uh, we can uh, divide the vessels to uh, an ear. Uh, we can divide the nerves to an ear and try to duplicate some of these aspects of uh, the loss of the neuroinflammatory response. The most profound uh, uh, observation is that uh, diabetes alone has a major effect on wound healing, even in this uh, rabbit model, without ischemia, uh, without uh, dividing the nerves. But uh, <clears throat> Lena has uh, uh, published work uh, uh, that uh, shows the extensive uh, changes in cytokine expression uh, neuropeptides and uh, neuropeptide receptors. Uh, dysregulation of neuropeptides and cytokines associated with neuropathy has a profound detrimental effect on skin physiology and protective mechanisms. There is an entire area of cutaneous neurobiology. Uh, if you think about these problems like psoriasis, et cetera, uh, the connection between the nervous system and the skin is pretty profound. Uh, and there are many mediators involved. If you want to get a good summary of this subject, I recommend Lena's uh, review, uh, published in uh, 2009. Uh, this, I think, uh, will give you a good start in understanding how significant the loss of the neuroinflammatory response is in affecting the fate of the diabetic foot. So what does this mean to us as clinicians? Protective barriers are lost. Injuries and infections are mass. Patients, as you know, can have an abscess in their foot and you barely have any uh, skin evidence of that with minimal erythema. A recognition of infection is delayed until it becomes advanced physiologically and bacteriologically. So you have multi multiple organisms involved. And by the way, the appearance of infection at surgery is different. So. Uh, as Dr. Varma showed those uh, pictures yesterday uh, following these extensive debris months, you can never be sure you have all of the infection out with diabetes because there's no in inflammation or pus sometimes to guide you at the ex extremes of the infection. So you always have to be prepared to go back. All right, so here it is. This is the most important concept I want to get across. And I'll keep coming back to this. These feet have a compromised biology. They're, the definition of critical limb ischemia doesn't apply here because every foot is different. We cannot measure the degree of compromised biology in a diabetic foot. There's loss of the neuroinflammatory response, uh, endothelium dependent relaxation is altered, all sorts of effects of glycosylation on the basement membranes, uh, cells, uh, uh, proteins, uh, scleral proteins, et cetera. You can't measure it. So uh, <clears throat> you can have a foot that has extremely uh, poor biology and uh, there it is, uh, has 100% terrible biology. This is sort of like a charcoal foot. You cannot keep this foot healed uh, under any sort of pressure. Uh, at the other extreme is a perfectly normal foot. Really, really good biology. Here you can have very poor perfusion and a foot will stay healed. Our patients are all somewhere between these two, but we can't measure where it is. So what we measure in terms of ischemia is really not relevant. The key question is, is there correctable ischemia present? It's the only thing we can fix in this foot that will improve the biology. So one patient may be patient A who has quite poor circulation uh, and requires revascularization, but patient B doesn't have such poor 
circulation, but still requires revascularization to heal. That's point number one. Point number two is, because these patients have compromised biology, when you do a revascularization, you want to get maximum perfusion to the foot to protect that foot uh, over time. So ischemia is a relative concept. And again, 60% perfusion, perfusion in one foot may lead to an ulcer, but not in another foot with better biology. We can't measure biology. Now, Joe was just up here, and I think he'd refer to me as a lesionologist. <laughs> but I hope you'll refer to me as a biologist, because that's what we're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> so neuropathy, the compromised biology, require maximum perfusion. Uh, the other aspect, of course, in diabetes is uh, vascular occlusion often involves the infragenuculate arteries. And so you want a target that's going to deliver the best perfusion possible to the foot. But it has to be one, as a surgeon, that you can work with. And in the end, often this is the dorsalis pedis artery. About 30% of our patients presenting with diabetic foot ulcers uh, require a dorsalis pedis artery uh, to obtain uh, healing. So, I guess this is the coda right here. It's pretty, pretty short. Uh, if a patient shows up with a, a foot problem, of course you immediately must drain any closed space infection and do a good, have a good shot at uh, uh, dependent drainage. Uh, you can't feel a pulse in that foot. It's pretty simple. Then you know you have correctable ischemia. Get an arteriogram, and as soon as the patient is stable in terms of their uh, uh, renal function, their glycemia, et cetera, get them to the operating room, do the bypass, and then take another look at the wound. So, uh, one other comment about that. You, you might look at it and say, well, you know, you could do all these things, uh, toe pressures and TCPO2 and all these things, uh, but uh, I would suggest this. Uh, you can do it that way. If you have an ulcer, for example, over a full thickness ulcer over a pressure point on the toe, you can say, well, uh, maybe we can do a toe amputation. You measure toe pressure, this and that. You say, well, we'll, well by our records, uh, this has a 70% chance of healing. So you could take that approach, and I'm not arguing with it, but for me, it's not satisfactory. Because if it doesn't work, you have a much more severe problem than you started with when you could have gotten that ulcer healed with a good bypass. So what to measure, though, after we do these procedures? So I look at it this way. What does the patient want to know? They want to know if they're going to die from the operation. So that risk is, in, in our the series of over 1,000 HDP bypasses, almost exactly one in 100. Uh, it's low. These procedures are subcutaneous. They require light, general anesthesia. There's not a lot of uh, fluid extradition. It's not like an intra-abdominal uh, procedure or a chest procedure, et cetera. Will I lose my leg? If I, if I have this operation, will it keep me from ever losing my leg? They want to know that. And will my foot heal? So let's look at this question of whether I will lose my leg. This is uh, from my former colleague Frank Pompicelli's uh, uh, report of over 1,000 DP bypasses, showing that 10 years out, the limb salvage rate is 52%. Now, what does that mean to a patient? Well, here's an important fact. At 10 years, only 18% of these patients are alive. This is a very powerful consideration in deciding what to do with these patients. Relatively few of them wind up with an amputation, even though at 10 years, you could say the limb salvage rate is 52%. That's the standard way we've been doing it. I think we ought to add another way to do it. If you look at 
lifelong limb salvage. That is, a patient dies and has not had an amputation. That patient forever does not have an amputation. So keep them in there, along with all those patients who are still alive and have not had an amputation. So we have lifelong or continuing limb salvage. Here is close to 90%. So the chance of the patient facing this operation of ever losing their leg uh, is about one in 10. So I like that. I like that in explaining things to patients because I think 10-year limb salvage doesn't convey what was really going on there. We're, we're looking at things in a way that is too complicated. So nearly 90% of patients never lose their limb after a DP bypass. Now here's another consideration. Will it heal? This is a really excellent study uh, by a former resident, uh, now a associate professor, a professor at uh, University of Florida, Scott Berselli, who looked at the outcome of forefoot and heel ulcers following DP bypass. And we're especially interested in heel ulcers because uh, when you do the bypass of the DP, of course, the heel ulcer is not in the anatomic vascular territory of the uh, dorsalis pedis artery. Uh, <clears throat> so the surprising thing here is that at one year, uh, nearly 80% of these ulcers are healed. These are heel ulcers now. And by two years, almost 90%, and they stay healed. So here we have the most distal bypass, the most recalcitrant ulcers, and have these excellent outcomes with rapid wound healing. Now this has an importance in a different way. Here we have survival with a healed foot. This probably is the most important thing to a patient. After all, they're clumping around with this big boot on, they, uh, going back and forth to the hospital. They've got the visiting nurse intruding in their home. They can't travel, all sorts of things because they have a, an open wound on their foot. Here, within a year, almost all of them are going to be healed. So, and the other aspect of this is that they're rapidly dying, has been pointed out here several times. They don't have a lot of time. So here's my comments about that. Don't fiddle and diddle. Now you have to be an old Celtics fan to understand the significance of that. Uh, but the patient pays the price in terms of the lost quality of the few precious remaining years of their life they have. They could spend that year now uh, doing all sorts of things that they cannot do if they have an open wound on their foot. So the value of anything that delays effective vascular reconstruction must be demonstrated. You can't say, well, we'll do it, it does no harm, because if you're taking up time, you're harming the patient. So again, get back to this, just a reminder. We can't tell or measure the biology in this foot. They're all different. The lesion tells you that the foot cannot stay healed under the current conditions. And uh, you can take a chance in dealing with some of these things in the absence of revascularization, but you are taking a risk. It's the patient who's taking the risk. You, sh you can do these reconstructions with a high degree of success and both in terms of wound healing and limb salvage. And a final comment is that these operations are simple operations. I don't know why this idea has gotten out there that these are complex or difficult operations. These are subcutaneous procedures. They take time. It may take two and a half, three hours to do a DP bypass. Uh, you have to be careful, but that's what we do. And uh, the results are excellent. In my view, no one should complete a vascular surgery training in this country without being able to do a DP bypass comfortably. I'm sorry to say we're a long way from that, but there's no reason for it. You can do it. If you're a vascular surgeon and you haven't uh, done this, I encourage you uh, to 
do everything you can to, to find out how to do these procedures. The reward is tremendous. That patient comes into your office, they're scared to death, they're gonna lose their leg, you examine them, nice popliteal pulse, you can't feel a pulse in the foot. You know right then and there, there's a 95% chance you can save that limb. That's a really good feeling, and it's a really good feeling after the procedure uh, to know that uh, this is what you trained for, this is your technical expertise, and um, that has what made a different, huge difference in this patient's life. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here, and I look forward to our discussion.